Good evening, good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, a warm welcome uh, to you all for the second in these conversations as part of Mike Dib, A Listening Eye, a major retrospective of the extraordinary filmmaker's work um, here at Whitechapel Gallery. My name is Gareth Edwards, I'm the adjunct moving image curator here at the gallery and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all wherever you might be watching from uh, to this second conversation, um, as I said, with our wonderful special guests, of course, Mike Dib and Jeff Dyer. Now more on both of them very shortly, but before I do that, um, uh, some of you will recall in our first conversation last month that a certain kind of baking motif um, came into my introductory comments, um, which seemed to serve uh, very well the purposes of that opening conversation. We were thinking out loud about kneading the dough and rising to the occasion and such like. And it seemed to me that uh, in the second of our conversations, a vehicular metaphor would be very useful because transports of delight are what awaits you uh, dear audience, this evening with our wonderful conversationalists speaking about the arts of improvisation. Now, of course, none of this comes to you um, without immense amounts of work behind the scenes. In fact, many people now, right now, are behind um, this Skegness deck chair um, where I will be uh, asking them to obviously keep me online and on track as we go through uh, this hour's conversation. You'll be delighted here, of course, that I would not be in conversation with Mike uh, this evening, but we have one of the major conversations, of course, in literary culture, speaking to Mike. And you'll notice when he appears that there is a brightness both to his demeanour, but also to the landscape around him, which suggests that he is not currently in the UK. And that, of course, uh, is actually a fact. And it shows already the internationalist reach of this project, um, our desire to globalise the Mike Dibb retrospective and to bring it to as many people and to as many continents and, in fact, coastlines as we are able to um, in the current crisis. Now, for, for that to even vaguely become a possibility, of course, I need to thank everyone on the Good Ship Whitechapel. That's the captain of public programmes currently, uh, my colleague Jane, of course, everyone above and below decks uh, within the gallery organisation. And tonight, of course, behind the scenes, benign drone pilot, Andy Jenkin, who is obviously delivering everything for us technically, uh, with the assistance, of course, of his sergeant, Sam Williams. Now, these are people without whom, of course, we cannot deliver such a project. But culturally, of course, the content of this uh, great undertaking, um, I need to thank three other key uh, players. Now, if we think of the Mike Dib retrospective as a, a multi a uh, multi-carriaged uh, uh, locomotive, of course, driving through the landscape of contemporary culture. Then the stokers and drivers, of course, of that train are without question Matthew Hall and Colin McAuliffe, taking on both roles, both filling the engine, of course, with uh, creative fuel and also driving it uh, towards its destination, which, of course, is a few weeks away still. But they would be as nothing without the conductor, guard and signal person, Rachel Winton. Uh, we thank her with all those different hats on, of course, uh, for making uh, everything possible uh, from her side of the operation. And of course, without you, the audience, other passengers on this journey, uh, then we would, of course, be driving an empty train, a little bit like Andre Konchalovsky's runaway train with the madness of John Voigt, um, uh, our only co-pilot and co-passenger. Thankfully, that's not the case. We have an incredible uh, conversational duo for you this evening, both, of course, coming from England, but as I said with Jeff Dyer, uh, he is coming to us direct and live from the morning of Los Angeles. Not the morning, of course, as in uh, a morning in a grief sense, of course, although we all uh, are very aware of the times in which we're living. and We're very grateful that Jeff can be with us and give up his time uh, to be in conversation with Mike. But a bright morning, which will be evident as soon as he appears uh, on this uh, on this platform. Now, I should say, of course, talking about platforms, uh, given the tra uh, transport motif of this introduction, um, the Jeff's books are available wherever uh, you shop on whatever platform you choose uh, to find your purchases. And of course, also, uh, if you are on a major station, possibly on an actual platform, there are still bookshops, of course, available uh, in certain major termini across the country and beyond. Now, Jeff is coming to us uh, from Los Angeles this morning for him. Um, and unlike Marvin Gaye, of course, and Paul Young, um, wherever Jeff finds himself at home, he does not lay his hat because, uh, to my knowledge, uh, he never wears a hat. I've never seen him actually with a hat. But we know that where Jeff lays his home, bakes his home, is, of course, where he unpacks his library. That's because he's a writer. Now, for the younger members of the audience, of course, a writer is someone who writes books, not someone who writes Instagram posts um, or he even creates Instagram stories. Jeff is a writer in the old mode. He comes in that sense from the past. The past is a foreign country and they do things differently there. He's a writer. Uh, as is Mike. Mike is a filmmaker, but also a very good writer and, of course, writes 
films that we are uh, enjoying in the course of this retrospective. So Jeff is a writer and he writes books, but of course he crosses borders in all his writing. He travels, as we say in France, of course, sans papier across borders, often illegitimately, uh, in a hybrid way, approaching the literature and culture uh, of which he has a great and abiding interest. But of course, he also travels, as they say in France, avec papier, because he produces books. So in that strange contradiction, that challenge, of course, uh, that is the uh, great creative talent uh, that is Jeff Dyer, we find, in a way, many of his abiding skills and qualities. There were incredible scenes here, I have to say, at uh, Mike Dibb Retrospective HQ, when Jeff Dyer agreed to be, of course, on board the great train of, uh, of the Dibb Retrospective. Um, and so it is with great pleasure um, that I welcome both, uh, uh, both our wonderful talents this evening, uh, Mike Dibb and Jeff Dyer. Welcome to you both and goodbye from me until later. Good, hello everyone. Hello, Mike, you're there. <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> Gosh, well, everything else is going to be a bit of a letdown after that. <laughs> I mean, it's just so, I mean, uh, at some point we're probably going to talk about the state of arts programming on TV, but I don't know, I feel that it'll uh, it'll not be great until Gareth gets his own TV show, don't you? I mean, he really does. I, I, no, no, it's waiting in the wings. Yeah, and in typical Gareth way, he's thanked everybody, but really, I mean, we have to, I think, Think, uh, thank Gareth for pulling off yet another retrospective. I think you'll remember, Mike, when he was telling us about his ludicrous plans for this absurdly vast John Berger retrospective, which was never going to happen. And then, of course, it did happen on an even larger scale than, uh, than, than he'd claimed. And now we've got this great retrospective of your work. And I feel that I've now got a reason to stay alive, that maybe at some point he might be able to come up with a retrospective uh, for me, and I really hope he does, because these introductions he gives, I mean, they're just, they're on a par with Ronnie Scott's introductions, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, to sustain that metaphor all the way through for about five minutes plus, it was yeah, pretty good, I thought. It really was. A, it was a runaway train in its, in its own right. So, um, yeah, absolutely. This is great, Mike. But I guess we need to um, start this, this conversation with... Um, uh, something that uh, uh, your friend, and we we're going to talk about him quite a bit, Ian Carr says in the, the film about, um, uh, uh, about your film about Miles Davis. And he makes, I think, a really great corrective. You'll remember that he says, you know, people are always commenting about Miles that he never looked back. And he says that, uh, of course, Miles was looking back all the time, but he used that as a way of going forward. So I guess the danger for these retrospectives is that they can be like tombstones and I just wonder how you feel about this uh, retrospective you're still you're still going forward you're not just the I don't know the Kingsley to Saul's Martin as it were no well in fact it's wonderful really because uh, it's actually been a tremendous lift through this lockdown just to actually look back and what was uh, pleasing to me was how fresh the films felt which was something I was worrying that they would not do so. But they still seem to live uh, very um, much in the present. And, uh, and I think that's true, I hope, of the Miles Davis and the, and the Keith films, you know, and all these music documentaries. In a sense, one does those, it's a kind of trace of a life. But I think what's terrific about film and making these things is that you have so many levels. You know, when you're talking about Miles, you can just hear Miles. And you can talk, and you, and when you're talking or to the conversations with all the people who played with him, uh, at that moment they're carrying the film. You know, the film is about what they are saying at that moment. And so, uh, and the extent to which jazz, in a sense, is uh, music which is preserved through recordings, uh, not notation, um, it's, um, I, I love doing them, I have to say. And this is, there's a pleasure in the meeting. And I think Ian Carr has been absolutely crucial to all my films on jazz, but we can pass. And I think was also very important to the wonderful book you wrote, but beautiful about jazz. And uh, uh, yeah, so yeah. if I'm thinking of anyone at the moment, I'm thinking of Ian and how important he's been in my life. Yeah, well, let's, uh, uh, before going any further then, um, uh, obviously he wrote um, um, a, a uh, a biography of Miles Davis, um, and then went on to do um, uh, a biography of 
Keith Jarrett, but your relationship with him goes way back, doesn't it, Mike? Where did, where did, where did, when did your paths first cross? I don't know, it was in the 60s, and uh, um, the Don Rendley and Carl Quintet, I don't quite know whether I knew somebody who knew um, Ian, but anyway, I used to go to a lot of the Don Rendley and Carl Quintet things, and what is interesting about Ian, of course, he was also a very literary guy, you know, his Bob of the West must be the best, well, most well-read jazz musician in history. Um, and uh, he used to do a lot of poetry and jazz. Mm. And um, so I got to know Ian very well. And then, funnily enough, it was the very first film I was allowed to do in which I actually took camera crew outside the BBC premises to this little um, club in the West End, not a very uh, photogenic little space. We were able to make this film among the Don Rendley and Carl Quintet. And it started with Dave Green, the uh, bass player, his wedding in the East End, uh, in which the quintet, the rest of the quintet, apart from him, apart from Dave, were in the organ loft. And um, so I got to know Ian and, 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 um, and when you're making a film with someone, it's a very, very good way of getting to know one, somebody very well, really. Um, and uh, we just enjoyed being together. I enjoyed his music and I enjoyed his conversation. And I, what I loved was his passion mm -hmm. and his, also his generosity towards other musicians. That was terrific. And I think that's what, you know, I mean, who else would have written the essential book of jazz, uh, that guide to jazz, obviously not on his own with two others, but still his, his, his feeling and his love of other musicians um, was, uh, was wonderful. And so after that first film of Ian's, um, the other two sort of grew out of, of conversations with Ian and what he was preoccupied with and when he was making the Miles, writing the Miles Davis. We always dreamed we might be able to make a film together. Uh, and funnily enough, the genes and genesis of both the Miles Davis films and the Keith Jarrett films actually spanned a kind of 30 years between our first thing of doing them and actually being able to finally get them off the ground because jazz was not a, um, a, a music which the BBC uh, really paid any attention to. And that's why I enjoyed doing the Don Rendley and Carl Quintet. It only was an item in a magazine programme at the time. Mm -hmm. And so all I've got is not really the finished film. I've got a version of it almost finished. Um, and, um, and so uh, it was nice to be able to actually bring a film about jazz, a jazz quintet, into an arts documentary series, arts, arts, um, arts magazine series. I mean, um, on BBC Two, and uh, so that was the beginning of my relationship with Ian. And I think, with relation to uh, to Jarrett, it was very important that you had somebody that Jarrett was uh, sympathetic towards because he and Jarrett speak the the same language. They're, they're both musicians. But uh, I guess what we should do now, if we can ask, let's, uh, before we talk a bit more about the, the Jarrett film, I think uh, if it's okay with you, Mike, let's, uh, let's ask Andy to show a, a very short clip from that film, because it really, this clip will be, uh, will, it gets to the heart of the matter. Right. So can we do that, Andy? So, uh, yeah, there we have it. Now we're, we're right at the crux of things. Uh, uh, and uh, you, I'm sure you know the line, I'm gonna quote at you, Mike. It's Jarrett saying, you know, the thing about improvising, no editing is possible. 
So there we get at the, the kind of fundamental incompatibility between your subject and the medium that you're working in. So I guess, you know, I suppose the exception to that would be that at one extreme, it would be the Fred Wiseman attitude where basically you get access, let the cameras roll, and then just broadcast the full 10,000 hours of basic training or whatever, whatever it happens to be. But uh, always in your field, I mean, you are a very, very skilled Part of being a great director is to be a skilled editor as well, isn't it? Well, I think that's really important to me, uh, the editing. But I think improvisation comes into, into that, really, because actually during the filming, when I'm making films, um, unlike um, a lot of people, I always keep my questions in, uh, mm. or, or many of the questions in, because when I'm asking questions uh, of people when I'm making a film, those questions are really me in my head, imagining potential connections between sequences and ideas. Um, and so, but it is an improvisation um, in so far as nothing is planned, like this conversation isn't planned. Um, and it's the editing, the pleasure of the editing is finding these connections and finding the best relationship between them. And a model I have in my head in a funny way, uh, I, before I went into the arts dimension, I did uh, science up to A-level and I did uh, chemistry and I was particularly interested in organic chemistry. And what's wonderful about organic chemistry is the carbon ring. And, that, and if you look at molecules spread out, as it were, diagrammatically on a page, it's wonderful because, you know, different elements are connected in different ways. And I've often had a sort of molecular approach to editing so that I have, I have occasionally put all the different sequences on a page and just seen how one could go into one sequence one way and come out another. And so you can see the potential connections between sequences, which gradually during the process of editing become stabilized into a form of the film. So improvisation and chance plays a lot in terms of the, of the process, even though at the end, of course, the, the film is a kind of crystallized product of that um, and I suppose that's true of jazz too you know I mean once the thing is recorded and whatever that's that the moment at which what was being improvised becomes settled as a form and I um, was that response about editing was worthy of the great Walter Murch <laughs> <laughs> well I don't know uh, but funnily enough the other thing that is really interesting to me is uh, I have a your copy of your book and on this particular edition, it's one which you dedicated to Ian. I think just before he died, perhaps his daughter gave it to me. Um, and so I have your book with Ian's annotations on it. Um, and, um, and that's really lovely too, because the, the very first sentence of your preface, if you take out the word writing and you just put filmmaking, uh -huh. It's exactly the same, that actually I set out to make a film and I allow the form of the film to be dictated by the subject. I try not to sort of impose a form on the subject prior to filming and just let each film grow from the, from the subject I'm addressing. Hmm. And, the, and I like the fact that that's true of your books too, which I love indeed. Well, just as a sort of side note to that, in terms of sort of dedications, when I was friends with Ian uh, in the late, uh, late 80s, early 90s, I think, I was staying at a friend's house in uh, Labrook Grove, and he was away, had a copy of Ian's uh, Miles Davis biography. So my friend was away, I got Ian to sign it and then just put it back on the shelf so that many years later, suddenly my friend would uh, have come across this, uh, this dedication from, from Ian. But to go back to the uh, to the process of making the the Jarrett film, I mean, there's a um, uh, one of the I, at some point it might be in the Miles Davis film. Jarrett says this. He says um, um, uh, the great thing for him, the great achievement of playing with Miles, is that he said uh, was that uh, he got to see Miles Davis happy, and. You know, there's several things there. One, uh, there's the idea that maybe that wasn't such a common sight. And also, I think Jarrett himself was somebody who was uh, um, uh, not always so uh, 
easily satisfied. And I wondered, was uh, did you succeed in um, appropriately enough in making Jarrett happy with that film, both in terms of the process of filmmaking and the the end product? Yes, indeed, I did actually, and and, and but I was very worried about it because um, because uh, I had informally promised to him that when I finished the film, he'd see it before Channel 4 showed it. And then Channel 4 brought forward the, the transmission date. And I was terrified, but I sent the film off to Keith. Um, and I was dreading the phone call from him. But it was an amazing moment because it didn't come from him. It came from his wife, Roseanne. But the phone rang and she said, oh, it's Roseanne. And I, my heart sank. I thought, oh, my God, it's going to be a um, negative response. He said, Keith loves the film. We both do. There's only one problem with it. And I said, what's that? You got the, cat, you got the state in which he is born wrong. <laughs> I'd call it Allen, Allen, Allen Town was in... I don't know whether it was in New Jersey and it should have been in Pennsylvania. I don't know what I did. I did something and I yeah. thought, my God, if that's the only criticism that Keith has brought to this film, it's, that's just kind of triumph in itself. Yeah, you must have been worried that he'd heard that uh, somebody had coughed during the broadcasting and, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the start was, I mean, maybe, I mean, I can't tell you when, uh, when we arrived, we, uh, before we started filming, we decided we had to do a long interview because that was going to determine whether it's going to work or not. And so we fixed up to do this filmed interview and Ian and I, we picked up a New York film crew. It was the middle of winter. And we drove out to Keith's house and we arrived and there wasn't a great warm welcome. Um, so that was slightly worrying. And then the the van in which we'd been traveling skidded and went into a ditch so we had to first of all get a truck from local truck to pull it out of the ditch and uh, then I started chatting to 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 Keith and uh, and so we said well I said well where should we do it and and I suggested well maybe we should do it you know in your piano studio where you have two grand pianos and lots of other gear and stuff uh, and maybe buy a piano in case you um, uh, want to play anything or something like that. And he said, Mike, do you think I'm a performing monkey? I said, no, Keith, no, Keith don't worry at all. You know, um, we'll do it wherever you like. Um, and then the cameraman came up to him and uh, said, I don't think we really properly introduced. And um, Keith offered his hand to the cameraman and the cameraman said, um, well, no, maybe we shouldn't shake hands because I've got a little cold. I've got a... And Keith said, you got a cold? And then he called out, Roseanne, cameraman's got a cold. We have a tour coming. I think we should call this off. And I said, oh, Keith, look, we've come all this way. We can't possibly call it off. So Keith sent Roseanne to the local pharmacy to get a mask, something, of course, now we're ridiculously familiar with. And that whole interview was filmed by the cameraman wearing a mask <laughs> in case Keith got any uh, infection from him. But the thing, the thing is that what I realized is Keith created that kind of tension. And then in a way, when we started filming, I thought, gosh, this isn't going to very well. But then he completely relaxed and I was absolutely amazed. Any question I pitched, he was incredibly responsive to. But I think the other key was that um, Ian was with me and I said to Ian don't ask the questions because Ian always knew the answer to questions so if he asked questions the answer was implicit in them and yeah. you could just answer yes or no to them I said let me ask the questions but I think the presence of Ian and the respect Keith had for Ian meant that actually when the chips were down he wasn't going to screw up at all and make a scene I uh, were... and, and I think that conversation was wonderful and, and at the end of it, he said, you know, I enjoyed that in answer to your first question. Let's do a little bit more tomorrow. He very evidently did. I thought you were going to be telling a different sort of story there, a version of, uh, you know, the great story of somebody coming up to Jane Floyd saying, let me shake the hand of the man who wrote Ulysses. 
Mm. And Joyce famously, as he said, some, as it was recorded somewhat in the style of King Lear, said, let me wipe it first. It did a lot of other things as well. <laughs> and I think I should also add that I have shaken Keith Jarrett's hand. He did the sort of Brahmin handshake. It was a left hand handshake. But, uh, you know, I feel it's uh, for a pianist, it's a risky business shaking hands anyway, you know. Um, anyway, so uh, that's a wonderful story, Mike. And um, just to go back to some other things that struck me, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, I, my love of Jarrett is absolute. And watching that film, it made me realize that much as I love listening to his music, I've never particularly liked watching him so much. And there's several aspects to this. One is, I know in the film, Roseanne is um, uh, credited with, uh, you know, dressing him. And I, I realize I don't actually like his shirts, but that's, that's, that's irrelevant. But also I think it's something to do with this, that if you, I, I, forgive, forgive me if I got this wrong, but I think one of the sequences you feature is the trio playing, uh, I think it's Caribbean Sky from Tokyo. And it's one of those beautiful, unbelievably effortless, joyous, free flowing things. And then even in the midst of that, Jarrett it, uh, is all sort of scrunched up like this. And it's funny that you get the impression that maybe uh, producing this lovely music, he's not actually, as he claims to be, the vessel through which this new, the passive vessel through which this music makes. But it's, it looks like we're used to drummers, for example, always grimacing in agony. It's quite uh, the, 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 this is, this is, uh, it's not just high stakes music. It's, one gets the impression that it's, uh, it's more difficult for Jarrett than it sounds like. I wonder if you, it's like, let me put it like this. I know you will come on to sports more later. It's if you see Federer playing uh, in the flesh, you realize, oh my God, it's not all effortless ballet. It's real uh, hard athleticism. So anyway, just about your experience of seeing, seeing Jarrett play a lot. Where's, well, there was two sort of relations, two things in relation to that, um, because um, when uh, he was doing a sound check at the festival hall, uh, I I was told that I could film it, so I just went there with my own little camera and a friend who was a great Jarrett fan held a, a microphone, and when I arrived there. Um, Jack and Gary counted up, and they both sat down at two grand pianos, which were on the stage, and they started playing blues together. Mm -hmm. And that was magic. I thought, gosh, here I've got the bass player and the drummer starting off by just playing together on the piano. And then Keith turned up, and I thought, oh my God, he's going to say stop. <laughs> but he didn't. He, he just let me film. Mm. And when he was doing the sound check, I went right up and I was filming absolutely over onto his fingers. Mm. And actually he didn't move very much, but he actually was concentrating and it was rather beautiful. Um, and I realized, no, I thought actually, no, I did feel it was coming very, very freely. And what was beautiful also is it was as if he was thinking of me uh, because when I was doing the interview right down at his house, I say, you know, I would love to film you just doing a bit of bark. Um, and he said, you, you know, I won't do that. I won't do anything like that to order. But then actually on the sound check, he started playing the Goldberg variations. And I felt he was giving me something. I felt he was actually seeing what I needed and giving it to me, allowing me close to him. And, and, and that was really very, very nice. And I think it was rather sort of magical moment for me musically and uh, filmically. And then there was the second time, uh, which was very, very different. We went to, he was doing a solo concert in, in Vienna. And I was told I wouldn't be able to film it properly, but if I brought a camera, I could film a bit of him doing it. I arrived there and I've never felt an atmosphere so hostile, so difficult, so tense. <laughs> And Steve Cloud uh, said, Mike, no, there's no way you can be anywhere near Keith uh, to film this evening. And, uh, and 
fortunately, Manfred Eicher said, well, why don't you come into the, we're doing the recording control room. And I came, went up. And of course, not being able to film Keith from the auditorium was fantastic because actually I got into the control room. And so I was able to film Manfred listening to Keith. So it's one of those examples where something goes wrong. Yes. And if you don't panic, something goes right much, much better. And I was able, because I had still had the concert on a screen. On a, uh, so I had everything. I had Keith playing. And actually, once the concert started, it's completely relaxed. And I think there was a way in which Keith created tension, which he could then personally resolve. And the yeah. story behind the Kern concert, you know, that he thought the piano was terrible and that sort of thing. It's as if somehow, once he's there, he, his genius or his talent takes over. And, and but, it, but maybe there's a suppressor of tension beforehand, which needs him to charge him up in some sort of way. Well, let's, uh, let's leap ahead slightly. I want to come back to Jarrett, but that reminds me of something. It's not in your Miles Davis film, but it's quite a, a well-traveled anecdote that when Jarrett was playing with Miles, uh, another member of the band said to Miles, uh, um, uh, you know, I really, really hate what Keith's doing. Can you get him to not do that so much? And so Miles, uh, you know, uh, said to Keith X, I can't remember who it is. He really loves what you're doing, do it more. So, and then, I mean, that would seem to me to be, uh, I wonder if, if that's, if Jarrett got some of that from Miles, I, that he gets, cranks up this tension, which then he is able, which, uh, you know, adds to that amazing turbulence of the music in the 1970s and creates the perfect conditions for that, you know, the gorgeous uh, trumpet of, uh, of, yeah. of, of Miles. Um, let's just come back to, to Jarrett now, but uh, it seems to me that, it, the timing is is interesting, and in that you're interviewing uh, you're interviewing Keith, if I've got it right, after he'd had that bout of ME, and then he comes back from that with uh, the, that wonderful solo album, Melody at Night, with you. Yes, and I guess see, and of course, then he comes to you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, great playing still ahead of him, but we're seeing this film now at a really very poignant moment when it seems unlikely that Jarrett will ever perform in public again because as we as we heard I think in uh, towards the end of last year he uh, you know we were all aware that we hadn't heard anything from him for a while then it turns out he'd been in a nursing home uh, recovering from I think two strokes and he's still uh, I think that his left I think he can only use his right hand I'm told yeah that's, that's which is right. tragic uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if at some point we, we do hear some, something more from, from Jarrett. But uh, well, there's a huge backlog, of course. I mean, because Manfred Eicher at ACM has recorded every concert for so long. I mean, so there's an awful lot of material which hasn't been heard by Keith. Yeah. But I think any live performance is not going to happen. Yes, yeah, right. OK, well, let's move on then, because, God, time is so much. It's a shame we haven't got 12 hours to talk about this. Uh, uh, let's, let's talk. I just want to read something to you. This is that we're going to talk about Miles and Keith Jarrett some more now. But um, here's a, this is the best single thing I've ever read about Miles Davis. And I wonder if you've come across it before. It's from uh, Don Patterson, a poet who's also a, a jazz musician. And he says this, genius flowers by different means. Knowing he was Miles Davis made all the difference in the world to Miles Davis. But Bill Evans was Bill Evans largely on account of him not realizing he was Bill Evans. This is, the disadvantage with the second approach is that people like Bill Evans cannot wait to die and barely care if all their tunes are stolen. It's a wonderful observation, made all the more wonderful by the fact that he, uh, another Bill Evans played with Miles Davis on saxophone later on. And I think one of the great strengths of your film about Miles is that we see him in the process of going from, of course, a very, very uh, ambitious and accomplished trumpeter to becoming this figure of Miles Davis. And if you could just yeah, say something about that and also the sort of, the particular uh, stage that Miles was at in his Milesness when you were uh, when you were spending time with him. No, well, I never really did spend time with him. I think in a way the film I couldn't have made the film we did uh, before he died. Although we tried to make it very early on, and and uh, um, 
So none of the foot you you weren't uh, all the footage I, is archival, is it? Of the yes, uh, all the all it is of, of archival of Miles talking, um, and uh, though I did, I mean, <laughs> I had a I met I, I did have a strange first encounter with him. I was in New York and I got his phone number from, believe it or not, Gil Evans. And I was sitting in this hotel in New York. And actually it was the period when Miles had stopped playing. So it was the late seventies, I think he's about 75 to 80 when he just simply dropped out. And I paid to the phone and I said, do you phone Miles Davis? And I, but I did. And he picked it up almost immediately. He said, oh, who's that? And uh, I said, uh, well, you don't know me. I'm, I'm uh, and I work for the BBC television. BBC television, what do you want? And I said, well, um, we think you're one of the great jazz musicians. One of the, <laughs> <laughs> is there any money in it? Is there any money in it? And I said in that kind of terrible BBC feeble voice, I'm afraid BBC does things more like this, more for love than for money. Oh God, I don't, <laughs> not my way. <laughs> Um, and uh, he said, well, maybe you should talk to my lawyer. And uh, so that we left it at that. So I had my brief moment of conversation with, with, with Miles, which is very memorable in my head. And, uh, and then I think he was kind of, why he didn't switch off entirely, I think he saw that it might be a way back into Nina into music, that it was actually probably quite a good moment. The only trouble was his lawyer was coming to London and he said, um, let's meet up. And we met up and uh, we talked, had quite a positive conversation about the possibility because it's incredibly con complicated making these films, all the licenses and who owns what, etc. And then uh, about three weeks later, <laughs> he got a, I got a phone call from New York and this guy said, um, Mike, I got a bit of a problem. Miles has just picked up the phone and told me, you motherfucker, you're fired. <laughs> no, he said, you white motherfucker, you're fired. He said, so I don't think I'm going to be much help for a while. <laughs> you haven't so, been called the motherfucker by Miles Davis. You haven't really known him, it seems to me. Yes, no, no. So I can't say I knew Miles at all. Uh, but I did actually also in 1985, which was his last trip to London, he was playing at the Odeon Hammersmith and I was there. Everything there is means I, it's me, Ian, Ian Carr and I, yeah. everywhere I'm talking about and except in this hotel room in New York. And um, so, but, uh, but I didn't really meet him. It was, uh, but I was in his presence and Ian introduced me. So we did kind of, I think we shook hands and things, but uh, it wasn't really a meeting. Well, it seems to me, if you don't mind my saying, Mike, there is one, big problem about your Miles Davis film. And it's this, it's about uh, uh, eight and a half hours too short. It seems to me that with uh, uh, you know, uh, a life in music, not just as long, but as varied as Miles Davis, it's you need, you know, we need to give him the full Ken Burns treatment, you know, the full, uh, uh, and he gets relatively short shrift in the Ken Burns series. But I think, yeah, um, it's, one of the, uh, it seems to me that, I mean, there was a recent, several things with uh, relation to this. There was a recent documentary about Miles Davis. I think it came out maybe last year. And I was struck by the way it had, a, it was, it, uh, it added absolutely nothing, it seemed to me, to your film, except that Frances was even more charming than she was before. I love the way that she, not only that she survived this, uh, you know, this uh, appalling marriage. There's a, in the new film, there's a lovely line where she's talking about when she was a dancer back then. And she basically says, oh yeah, it wasn't just Miles. They were all crazy about me. But anyway, uh, it seems to me that- uh, oh, She was wonderful. Oh, and she, so when I interviewed her, she was um, maitre d' at Hamburger Heaven in, in Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> oh, shit. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and yet there was not a single note of bitterness in her conversation. Yes, that comes across in that, that new documentary when she's had even more time yeah. to reflect on it. No, but I don't like that new documentary. I mean, what was extraordinary, I saw an interview with the guy who made it, who said, well, it, it was the first film ever to be made about Miles. Oh, it's... And, uh, it's just a. Uh, they might as well have just shown yours instead. It's it's I it's 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 uh, there's it's there's no advance at all. But the other strange thing I think about it is that actually it didn't even mention Bill Evans when they talked about 
kind of blue. And Bill Evans' sensibilities are right through that um, in such a deep way. And in fact, you, in that quotation you first you mentioned a little while ago, which mentioned Bill Evans. Um, in fact, I think it was relatively recently that Bill Evans was then last credited for being the writer of Blue and Green. I think the originally it was it was um, assigned to Miles, and indeed the only person who who um, uh, refused to appear in the Miles film was uh, Wayne Shorter, and uh, not even. Um, when I was filming with Herbie Hancock, I suggested to Wayne Shorter and Ian tried to persuade him. To do. And he said, well, are you doing it with the Miles Davis lawyer? Uh, and I said, well, yes, obviously, unless you get the Miles Davis estate, you don't even walk out through the door. Um, and he said, well, I, well, I'm still in dispute about, the, about who wrote what. And he, he wouldn't do it because he was still angry because Miles Davis had claimed authorship for a song which he or a tune that he'd written, yes. and he didn't, and he couldn't be persuaded to appear, which is sad because it was a um, um, a great loss. I thought. Yes, absolutely. Well, it, just to uh, mention to our mutual friend and filmmaker Chris Mitchell, who was solely responsible for my understanding of jazz when. Uh, for the first times I heard Kind of Blue, he really emphasized the, uh, the colossal uh, importance of Bill, Bill Evans's contribution. I should add to people that we were going to show a clip, of course, from the Miles Davis film, but at the last moment, it turns out there were, there were issues with, uh, with rights, but I think people will have seen that uh, anyway. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it, this going back to this question of editing and, and jazz and improvisation, it seems to me one of the things about Miles Davis is that uh, because he was so, he lived so entirely within the process of music making, that he's one of those people who actually benefits from what I would call in shorthand the sort of Fred Wiseman approach. So that that music from the 70s, which uh, I think is a uh, such a great phase of, of Miles Davis's work. It benefits from being seen not in highlights, but in extenso, as it were. So that, for me, I mean, the, the key film here is that great Murray Lerner uh, uh, film of his appearance at the Isle of Wight, when he's, you know, and it's called, what's it called? Sort of call it anything you like. Uh, and you just see this uh, this incredible sequence of, uh, uh, of music uh, un unfolding. Um, anyway, uh, anything else to add about, uh, oh yeah, and that's what about, uh, then it was that phase of Miles's work is so interesting and I was so excited by the Don Cheadle film, which, which start, a fiction which starts off so well and then succumbs to, uh, to, to being rather, rather silly. But let's, uh, let's move on, Mike, because there's still stuff to- well, Just as one point I'll just take up with you. I mean, oh. no, I mean, it's just about the length of the film. I mean, what's it extraordinary? Because two hours seems like an incredibly long documentary. And what I'm very aware of is, in a sense, I'm just doing a trace of a life yeah. uh, when I'm making a film. But the only, re the only reward I get of the feeling is when I talk to all the musicians, and a lot of them have said an awful lot more than obviously I was able to use. Mm -hmm. They said, no, what, it might be a trace of a life, but it was a truthful trace of a life. Mm -hmm. And that's all I can hope for, I think. And all the uh, material I filmed for that, is lodged now with the British Library. Um, so that if anybody else wanted to ever do something more with it, it's there. And I'm pleased about that. Yes, of course, yeah. Uh, and this, yeah, I think this is the, the uh, this interestingly, I think we can move, maybe we should show it at ages since we've shown a clip. Yeah, we, can we yeah. show Andy a clip from- Oh yes, uh, we must actually move quickly, hadn't we? The Barbara Thompson uh, film, I think is is up next. Is that is that right, Andy? In 1979, Barbara and John's musical partnership was the subject of a 60-minute BBC documentary. And recently, a new book has been written about them. In the old days, we were balancing our musical life with uh, the children, touring, being away, coming back in and out all the time. Now, of course, it's balancing music and Parkinson. 
we are not reliable as people. And it's becoming increasingly difficult. We can live to our own deadlines, but it's becoming increasingly difficult to live to other people. I can organise a trip so that next August the 17th, we're, 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 we're on a stage in Vienna. I mean, I can do that, that's easy. But will we actually be able to walk out on that stage in Vienna when the audience is ready? That's what we don't know. And that means that it becomes very difficult to take those kind of things. Oh, it's going to be a bit of a game, this is, I think. Well, I mean, <laughs> life is a game and... Uh... Yeah, nobody ever said it was going to be fair. No. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the Miles Davis film is necessarily retrospective. Uh, the Jarrett film is from quite, uh, he's quite advanced in his career. I think what's so interesting about the, the, the Barbara Thompson, John Heisman films is that uh, you were, we're seeing them over the course of, well, a, a marriage and a life. And of course, I was asking you if you were, if you got intimate with, with Miles Davis, a slightly loaded question. It turns out you couldn't have been because he was, because <laughs> he died. But this is, uh, yeah, this is the intimacy of this, of, of this film with, with, Barbara Thompson and John Heisman is remarkable. I think it's one of your, uh, really one of your, your well, you know, it's a, it's a very strong sequence from you, this, this pair of films. Perhaps you could it, say a bit, just- Well, in fact, it. I mean, it's again, Ian, because I met, um, he was one of the in, um, bands he played with was the United Jazz and Rock Ensemble. Mm. And uh, I'm not gonna mention Miles again, but I just have to say that I went to hear the United Jazz and Rock Ensemble uh, in Berlin, and I went there because Ian and I were talking about a Miles Davis film, and there was a lot of archive material there. But actually, after the concert, I sat with John and Barbara, and I really liked them. And I thought, and, and I, and so that's the seed of it. Was um, and so I got to know them, and uh, and. John was wonderful, one most extraordinary guy, but not only a brilliant drummer, but a wonderful sort of incredibly brilliant self-teach, self-taught. I mean, he was a self-taught drummer. Uh, oh, he he had drummer. his own recording studio, but he set up his own recording studio. He'd know all the ins and outs of how to record the technique. When video cameras came along, he learned completely about uh, video technology. And then when Barbara was struck, was terribly, tragically struck with Parkinson's, John looked after her for about 19 years and he became such an expert on Parkinson's yeah. that actually the, all the Parkinson's consultants, if there was a, um, a conference about Parkinson's, would always ask John to come along, but he explained the disease much better than they did. Um, and so there was something wonderful about John and he was so generous and outgoing and, and, and I love Barbara too and she's extraordinary, extraordinary person. And it was very unusual to find a woman with such power, you know, and you know, when she picked up the double sax, you know, like Roland Kirk, you know, there was something really I found moving and I expected that she was going to inspire a huge number of women to pick up the saxophone, but I don't think it really has happened. Um, and, um, and so I just loved doing it and they gave themselves so freely and easily to the film, and uh, and I think actually the concert, the one which I filmed of the Bracknell Jazz, yeah. it's, is is a lovely. I really like it. I just looked at it again. I hadn't seen it for years, and I really liked it because what I felt was the. I asked the cameramen never to sort of panic if they weren't on the this, and I really felt the cameras were really looking. I mean, talking about listening eye, I felt. They were, they were listening to the music and moving in relation to it and moving to, but they weren't whizzing to who was playing the solo. They were just going drifting till you picked up the solo. And I really felt the musicians were really listening to each other. There was a sort of intensity about it. And because it was in a tent rather than in a dungeon down below, which is where Jones is normally filmed, it had a sort of billowy quality. You know, you could feel the canvas blowing in and out. And so I really, liked it anyway. And then of course, when they, Barbara did have um, Parkinson's, um, they allowed me the same, and we were very close friends and very good friends. And I, and I think 
the Parkinson's people have really liked it. It was funded a bit by the welcome. And it's a very moving film. And, and then, of course, tragically, John dies of a brain tumour. Um, and Barbara's still alive. But I spoke to her a little while ago, a, few min uh, a week ago. And uh, she's amazing. She's in a care home because she can't. But she's still alive. And she was, she, I think she still keeps going because she's composing in her head all the time. And she said to me, oh, well, I've, I've, I've finished the first movement of my piano concerto, but I've still got two movements to go. And she's crippled by Parkinson's. I mean, so she's a very, very unusual and, and tenacious spirit and very creative spirit. I love her. Yeah. Well, it's so easy to get weak need with nostalgia about any festival, but let's say a special word about Bracknell Jazz Festival, how wonderful it was. I remember the first time I went there, John Lurie and the Lounge Lizards were, were playing, and he was he was just sort of bitching about it because it was all, you know, it was rather sort of make-do in a way. And uh, somebody called out from the audience, we like it. And it was really, yeah, we did, we did like it. It was wonderful. Mm. You know, time is racing on, Mike. I mean, I'd wonder if you could just speak very, we'll go from that domestic um, uh, film, domestic in the sense of homegrown English, just maybe say something very briefly about your, uh, that major film that you made about uh, Astor Piazzolla. And I think since people can see the film anyway, rather than show the clip, if you could just uh, say something about that. Well, that's a, a, again was um, a very happy accident. Um, I did actually meet Astor Piazzolla um, once when he came over in the 70s and a great friend of mine, Tony Stavaker, um, also met him then. We worked on a, a, a program together and um, Tony um, had um, found a studio in Bristol and recorded uh, the last concert of Astor Piazzolla ever, because after it, it was the last recorded concert, he had a terrible stroke. And he also recorded a long interview with him. And he kept the whole interview, even though he had used a few bits of it in his program. And it was Tony who came to me saying, why don't we try and make this film with Astor Piazzolla? And amazingly, we were given the, but of course, a very low budget, so I had to film it all myself. Mm. But it was a wonderful journey of discovery into Argentina and Buenos Aires and these wonderful musicians. And, and uh, I just, I really was, I was inspired by his music when I first heard it, but that was quite a long time before I made the film with him. And, yeah. uh, and I didn't make it with him, of course, he'd be died, but I made it with all the other people who you see in the film. And so I, I, I love it really for its, uh, and you cannot believe, you just cannot believe that that music is not improvised. The fact that it's all written down is amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. but the first, the other film, which of course we haven't talked about, which is also very important, was the opportunity to go to Cuba and drive, spend three weeks driving around Cuba, picking up the most wonderful music all over the place. And, um, and it was a long way before whatever that thing is, what's the other film which was done, you know, which was such a big success about Cuban music, what was it called? You mean you didn't make the Buena Vista Social Club, Mike? Yeah, you know, the, and, and the Buena Vista Social Club was all pitched on the idea that, you know, these old people have had a terrible time, but obviously quite a lot of the musicians I filmed with, and particularly oh, yeah. with Enrique Jorin, you know, fancy meeting the guy who'd invented the cha-cha-cha, a delightful <laughs> man. Well, um, that is and, such a great line. Fancy beating the guy. <laughs> <laughs> but they've I, never. But but and, and 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 his band, of course, were several of the musicians who turned up in the Buena Vista Club as if they've been, you know, left on the heap um, yeah. since Fidel took over. Well, let's say, you know, who needs Vim Vendors when we've got uh, Mike did, but, but I'm conscious, Mark, there's so much more we could talk about. Uh, I apologise if I let us dwell too much on Miles Davis and Keith Jarrett, but uh, God, for me, it's been a, a great pleasure and honour, Mike. And well, It's uh, been lovely to talk to you, and I think your book is absolutely terrific. It's, it's yeah, a, yeah. Thank you. And I've got lots of other things I want to say to you about your book and Coleman Hawkins, but there be, we go. Because I be. met Coleman Hawkins in the Bull's Head in Barnes. <laughs> And I felt like that. I felt when I think, thought about it, when I read your book, I always think that's almost an anecdote for your book, really. really? Yeah, I wish you told me back when I was writing it. OK, yeah. we'll just hand back to uh, the, the Ronnie Scott of this event, uh, uh, Gareth Evans. 
incredible scenes here in front of the Skegness deck chair. Uh, what a wonderful conversation. Thank you both so much indeed for the kind words, of course, but much more importantly for the incredible insight and the conversational wit with which you engaged with, of course, Keith Jarrett, Mars Davis, Barbara Thompson and the Cubans, and not forgetting, of course, Asta Piazzolla. Thank you so much, Jeff and Mike. I love the idea. Um, I met Colman Hawkins in, where was it, Mike? The Bull's Head in Barnes. In the Bull's Head in Barnes. It's either a track, of course, a B-side no, jazz no, but track. It's, but, it's, but it's extraordinary. He just was, all he had was a bottle of brandy beside him, and he did die an alcoholic. And you couldn't believe that this guy sitting in a corner um, would ever play. But then suddenly, you know, he'd stand up and play. And that was just like a moment from Jeff's wonderful uh, way of writing about jazz. Exactly. Well, I know it's not a fishing contest, Mike, but I saw Dudu Pukwana play at the Plough in Stockwell. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's, there we okay. are. Sorry, we're preempting you, Gareth. Keep going. No, no, absolutely not. No, no, I can't begin to outdo you on the on the uh, jazz appearance stake. So, no, wonderful stuff. Thank you so much indeed. Let's remind everyone, of course, that all of jazz books are available from all the usual uh, outlet sources and locations. Please do track them down. But let's also remind everyone, uh, many of you will not necessarily know this yet, that Jeff's new book, Seesaw, um, is going to be published in the UK by Canongate in April and by Grey Wolf in the US in May. Please do find that when it comes out. Ten years of writing about photography, of course. That's another book by Jeff. Of course, there's, there's more That's than one book, book by Jeff. That's the jazz book, but must beautiful. Read. A must read. Mike did. It says that on the back of the book. And it a says by read. Ian Carr, an imaginative tour de force in his handwriting. In his own handwriting. Now, you won't find that on every copy, of course, but you never know. Um, So do please find all of Jeff's books and continue on this great train that is the Mike Dib retrospective. Of course, uh, every Friday we launch new films. uh, So tomorrow morning there'll be uh, the chance for the next week's films to be seen. And of course, I'll be back uh, introducing the final conversation of the series on the 18th of March um, with Lisa Apignesi uh, speaking to Mike about his films with writers and other ideas uh, involved in the filmmaking over six decades. Incredible to have this conversation with, with you both. Uh, for our incredible pleasure and insight. Thank you so much, Jeff and Mike. Now, as you know, of course, there is a great tradition of conversational um, duos in English culture. We can think of the many great duos uh, on television, of course, and on the stage across the last decades. Now, I can see Dyer and Dib, Dib and Dyer, take your pick, whichever way you want to go. As the pandemic eases, rolling a conversational series out across the UK, possibly on a bicycle made for two to keep that transport motif in the air, um, and taking... What we, or what we obviously all know to be true, which is the idea that culture matters, to places where culture is still an idea waiting to happen. That's how the past, of course, in the present becomes the future. And that's what this conversation is very shortly about to become. The future, of course, with memories of the past and what a present it's been. A moment in time caught like jazz with the improvisational brilliance, of course, of Mike, Dib, and Jeff Dyer. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you to our wonderful audience, wherever you might be, uh, for being with us. Thanks to everyone at the Whitechapel and all the team on the Dib Locomotive. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you both very much indeed. And now we shall say, both here and in LA, good night here and time for lunch, I think, in LA. Thank you all and very thank much. Thank you indeed. very much, Gareth, for setting it all up. That's a lovely.